Hello everybody and welcome to this video which is the first in a series dealing with the objectives for the Alpic 101 exam. The original intention was to have one video per objective but some of these objectives to really understand them require more background knowledge than will fit in the 10 to 15 minute window that we allocated for ourselves per each episode. This is the case with the first objective that we're going to be looking at so this is going to be broken down into multiple videos and what we will do is do the background explanation in the first video and then later relate that back to the objectives in 101.1. .1. So let's have a look at the 101.1 .1 objectives. So let's have a look at these objectives now. If we have a look here, there's a standard format to how these objectives are set out. It starts off with a title, a weight, which tells you how much effort or how what the weighting is of this particular subject area in the overall certification, a description, and then key knowledge areas. And this is followed by a list of files and utilities that you need to know which relate to the key knowledge areas. It's always good to read through the key knowledge areas and the list of files and utilities and make sure that you have some understanding of all of these lines that are mentioned here, terminology, keywords, etc. before you write your exam. Now what I want to do before we go through each of these key knowledge areas one at a time is provide background information about hardware configuration in Linux. Essentially, this is what this section is about, 101.1. .1. It's about configuring hardware in Linux. Also, as weighting of two measures, you just have to be familiar with this topic. I'm going to explain a lot more in-depth than is required for this exam. But my motivation is to provide you with a conceptual model to understand what we are talking about. That way, if you come across a problem later, if you've got a conceptual model, you can think about it at a deeper level, ask the right questions and find more information and troubleshoot it more effectively. So without further ado, let's start on the conceptual model. So let's discuss how hardware is configured on a Linux system. Now, when you say configured on a Linux system, some of the configuration is actually independent of the operating system. It's defined by standards like PCI and USB. Therefore, the, the process by which these resources are negotiated or programmatically set on the hardware for those devices or for those buses that support programmatic configuration is pretty much the same across all operating systems. Obviously, each operating system has to implement its own code or, or modules or kernel code to be able to actually configure these devices. So if we break configuration of hardware down into two major camps, we have static configuration and dynamic or programmatic configuration. Now when PCs first came out, everything was statically configured. This meant that you'd have to have a configuration file which informed the kernel what resources to assign to a, a piece of hardware. Uh, obviously this had its limitations because every time you put a new piece of hardware in there might be conflicts. So you'd have to manually go and assign resources. Initially there's also limited resources, so you might have conflicts with two devices trying to claim the same resource. Back in the day, when you had ESA cards, you'd even have to physically go and change jumpers on the cards to change this resource assignment and then change the configuration file that Linux would read to configure that device at boot up time so it could actually be used by the kernel and by applications. So the static assignment of configuration information obviously doesn't work very well, cause a whole bunch of problems and issues, conflicts, etc. And also the limited resources of the old PC architecture meant that there were constantly conflicts. So you had to disable one piece of hardware to be able to enable another. So as the standards evolved in terms of buses, so buses are the, are the, are the ways peripherals connect to the CPU in, in modern PC architecture, as new bus technology came out, what they developed was this plug and play approach. And basically this means that the hardware can be configured programmatically and resources can be assigned dynamically to enable the kernel and the hardware working together to be able to assign resources and avoid any conflicts. So things just work, supposedly. And these are the PCI and USB buses. Now there are still some static buses that are used in Linux. Actually there's quite a lot. Most of them are hidden from us. But for example, if you're using IoT or embedded devices, it's far more common to find static buses or statically configured hardware, such as the R squared C bus, which is quite common. Another issue with devices and hardware was can they be configured at runtime, so hot plugability, or are they cold plug devices? Once again, in the early days, most devices, or nearly all, were cold plug devices. 
If they weren't plugged into your machine when it booted up, if you plugged them in later, the machine would not be able to configure them and have to reboot to configure that hardware, those hardware devices. Nowadays, most things are quite pluggable. We turn our, uh, we are connected to Wi-Fi, we close our laptop lid, we go to a different location, open it up and expect it to just keep on working, connect to the new Wi-Fi. We unplug our Ethernet cable, walk over to another um, Ethernet port, plug it in there and we expect our device to just pick it up and keep on working. So most things these days are quite pluggable. They just come and go from the system dynamically at runtime. So the principle by which these dynamic bus protocols work is that there's actually firmware running on the hardware which can communicate with the kernel and the kernel can issue commands which have been defined by the protocol for that particular bus to query the device, find out what its resource requirements are, assign them or negotiate them with the device and then configure it. For example, if you have a USB bus, when you plug in a USB device, it will interrupt the, comp the CPU to tell it it's new hardware. So interrupt, this is one of the resources that needs to be assigned to the new device as well, is a way for the bus to inform the CPU that there's new hardware available, actually to inform the CPU of any kind of event that happens with hardware. But let's just say from the beginning it will be to t inform the CPU that there's new hardware so that the kernel can actually configure it. Now IRQ is a unique number which is assigned to each device and to each event so that when the CPU gets interrupted it looks at this uh, IRQ number it then has what is called the IRQ handler which tells it what to do with this new information. So once the bus gets new hardware, it will interrupt the CPU. The CPU can then query the hardware and interrogate it and find out what its vendor ID is and its product ID. Now there's an international body which assigns vendor numbers to new vendors and then the vendors are responsible for assigning unique product codes to their, um, to their devices. So just like DNS, you can look up from a, uh, a human readable name to an IP address. So you can look up from a vendor ID and a product code to find out what the device is, the human readable name for the device. Now obviously the computer and the kernel doesn't care about human readable names, but for us as humans it does. But what this means is that the kernel has a list of devices that it recognizes based on its vendor ID and its product ID. When it gets informed that there's new hardware, it will look up Query this particular vendor ID and class ID and look up in terms of its modules to find if there's any modules that can handle that particular hardware. If it finds one, it will let that, be, it'll let that module configure and negotiate the, with the device for its resources. Typical resources are IOQ numbers, IO ports, re memory regions, etc. that it needs for this device to, to work. One of the important tasks of the module is to assign a device ID to the hardware so they can be interrogated by the kernel and used and accessed by user land tools. These are typically created under the slash dev directory which is a pseudo directory. By pseudo directory means it doesn't actually exist, it is just exists in memory, it doesn't exist physically on the hard disk. And this is how the kernel exports information to what's called user land and also how user applications can interact with the kernel. Now dev isn't the only pseudo directory, there's proc and the sys directory as well which we'll talk about a little bit later. Now, the module is up, it's up to the module to decide what to name the devices. So though we have different pieces of hardware like a USB drive, a SATA drive, and an SSD, and they've all got different modules that control and configure those devices, those devices also can use the same interface for sending commands to and from them. So in mass storage devices, for example, most of them use the SCSI subsystem. And therefore, they end up with similar names like DevSD for SCSI disk under the Dev file system even though the underlying technology and modules that are operating and responsible for carrying out those commands are different. This is important because one of the objectives I want you to know about is managing mass storage devices. What is happening now is that with SD drives, they've been limited by the SATA protocol and the SCSI protocol, and so they now have their own protocol, MVNE, and you see more and more NVMe buses coming out which enable foster access to the disks that are SSDs, and these will have a different device ID, no longer Dev SD, but Dev NVMe, as this is the, it's not using the SCSI subsystem to send commands to and from the disk. To give you a, a, a sort of feel for this, what I'm going to do is insert a USB drive into my laptop and we'll see how it gets automatically configured by Linux. Let us switch to the terminal.
what I'm going to do is run a command called tail. Now tail-f is just a command which lists the end of a file and follows it. So as new lines are written to that file, it will then display them to us on the console. We are going to look at var log syslog. It might be var log messages and other Linux distributions. And this is essentially the system log in Linux. Before we do that though, let's have a look at the current dev directory. And we will see that there are no SDA drives here. Because I haven't plugged in my USB stick yet. But we will see that the local drive is using SSD and it's using an NVMe controller. So it's NVMe 0. Let me enter the tail dash f var log syslog command and this is the bottom of what is currently in my log file. I'm now going to insert the USB drive. What we should see happening is the USB bus will notify the CPU or the op or kernel that there is new hardware. The new hardware, the kernel will then identify and query that hardware for its product ID, vendor ID. It, it will then get the USB subsystem to configure that module. Lastly, what we will see is the Dbus subsystem being invoked. Now, Dbus is a stands for desktop bus, and it's a, an RPC, an inter-process communication protocol that's used in software to enable different services to subscribe to notification events. For example, when a USB drive is plugged in, automatically open the file explorer so people can click on the files and start viewing photos, etc. Okay, so let me plug in the USB drive. Now we can see it being detected. We can see it, we can see the it's the kernel finding about finding the device, querying the device, and then subsequently Dbus being invoked. So I've just pushed Control C so that we can prevent the text from scrolling off the screen with new messages. But we can see a kernel USB high speed device. We can see it gets the vendor ID and the product ID. The USB is then configured as a mesh storage device. Okay. We see the entry being made under the sys file system and it's binding to this particular device. We'll look at the sys file system in detail a little bit later, but essentially it's telling it on this particular um, slot on the PCR bus is this USB device. Lastly, it gets assigned a, a device label, SDA in this particular case, and then right at the end we see it invoking UDISC. So UDISC is part of Dbus, it's responsible for listening to events related to block storage devices and it mounts it for us under media mark neon. Now if we go ls4 slash dev we're going to see that we have our SDA uh, 1 and 2 device IDs created for us. So what are Linux modules? Well the Linux kernel comes with everything. It comes with all of the device drivers that it needs for all of the hardware that it knows about, or which manufacturers or developers have written software for to interact with. So unlike Windows, when you get a new piece of hardware, you download a driver from the vendor's website. With Linux, the driver is already built into the Linux kernel. Now, when you compile the kernel, you have a choice with these drivers. You can compile them directly into the kernel, so it's part of the kernel, or you can compile them as modules. It's the same code. But if it's compiled into the kernel, it will be loaded into memory, even if you don't have that device on your system. So this is inefficient, especially when we have using servers and laptops and desktops, where there can be a myriad of devices. You can't have all the devices loaded into memory. Therefore, they get compiled as modules. And when hardware is detected, the modules are loaded into memory to be able to configure the device for use. For so let's have a look at the modules that are currently installed on this laptop. Now, I'm going to run the command lsmod for list modules. Just because a module is not listed there doesn't mean that it's not necessarily loaded because it might have, been might have been compiled into the kernel and is therefore loaded when the kernel is loaded. If I type lsmod, and I'm just going to pass this through sort so we can uh, f easily find the modules we are looking for. Now, if we look here, we're going to see that there are modules, some of them deal with setting up and configuring hardware, like the NVMe module. Some of them are to do with setting up and configuring things like file systems, or to do with the Linux firewall, like IP tables. So not all modules are for configuring hardware. It is 
functionality in the Linux kernel that can be compiled as a module. If you don't want to use the IP tables firewall and want to use a different implementation, then you don't have to compile it and use that particular module. Another example are things like modules that deal with file systems. So if you have an NTFS file system and you want to be able to read it in Linux, you need to have the NTFS module installed to be able to read the, the NTFS file system. So you can load and unload modules in Linux. And this is what we will look at as part of the objective is loading and unloading modules to configure or unconfigure hardware. So one of the modules I want to look at here is the line printer and parallel port module. Now parallel port printers haven't existed for many years, but they are cold plug devices and are statically configured. Therefore, they don't get auto configured if you plug them in. If we have a look and I go LS mod and I say grep LP for line printer, we're going to see here is the LP module. Also, if I go through and I say configure um, LS mod grep par port, we're going to see the parallel port driver. Now what we can see here, besides the name of the module and the memory size it is taking up, is what other drivers are dependent or module are dependent upon this module. The LP line printer module as well as the parallel port PC module is dependent on this particular module. So module dependencies can be important because when you're loading a module, you have to load the dependent module before you load the module that, it de that is dependent on it. So if B is dependent on A, first load A, then load B. If you want to unload a module, you can't unload A if B is dependent on it. You have to first unload B and then A. So although these are statically um, configured pieces of hardware, you might wonder how does it get into the kernel and get installed as a module anyway. This is because dynamic or static modules can be configured via configuration files in ETC to be loaded at boot up time. This is loaded by the CUPS subsystem, which is a common Unix printing subsystem in Linux, responsible for handing printers. And we'll have a look at its configuration file where you can see that once it's installed, it will automatically install the parallel port driver, even if you don't have a parallel port printer. But what we want to do before we have a look at that configuration file is look at loading or unloading partic this particular module. We don't need it, I don't have a parallel port printer, and it's taken up memory that is unnecessary. And for this, we can use the rmmod command. So I can say rmlp, it's going to ask me for my password. And when it comes back and say nothing, it means it's been successful, otherwise it would have given us an error message. If I go lsmod and I say grep lp, we're not going to find the line printer module. The line printer module has been uninstalled from memory. It's no longer used. I can reinstall this module by running mod probe. So instead of RM mod, if I said mod probe, it would then reload this module to memory so that it can configure any hardware or any parallel port printers that are connected to this machine. One of the interesting commands to know about is mod info. This will give us information about a particular module. So if you look at the modules, they always have names which aren't necessarily intuitive. So if you want to find out more information, you can run mod info and the module name. So I can run mod info LP and I get information about this particular module. All modules end in KO, which stands for kernel object. And what you'll see is that because modules come with the Linux kernel, the only way to get new drivers or to upgrade your drivers is to update the kernel. So this is why all modules are stored under libmodules and then a particular version of the Linux kernel. In this particular case, 4.15.0 or .0 version of the Linux kernel. If I wanted to get an, a more modern version of this driver or if there was a piece of hardware that was new and the 4.15.0 kernel didn't have the driver for that module, I'd have to upgrade my kernel. Now typically this is done in distributions, but when you up do a major upgrade to your distribution, like going from Ubuntu 18.04 to 20.04, or going from CentOS 6 to CentOS 7. Obviously if you compile your kernel manually, you can download the kernel, compile it, and then install a new kernel into your system. But that is an advanced topic. What is interesting about modules is that they can also take parameters, or at least some of them, if they've been written by the module developer, to be able to take parameters. If we have a look at the LP module, we can see that it can take two parameters, par port, which is a array of char p, character pointers, and a boolean parameter called reset. Now to find out what each of these 
options do, you have to read the, the documentation that comes with that particular module. So why am I mentioning this? Because one of the objectives in Alpic in the 101.1 is to be able to configure hardware. So one way to do it would be to install the module, and when you install the module, set the particular parameters. So, so the question is, how come the parallel port and the line printer modules were loaded when they're cold plug devices? They can't be dynamically detected at runtime. Well, as stated, there are configuration files that have to be created that the kernel reads on boot up to configure these devices. These are usually stored under etc uh, modules dash load dot d directory. But we'll see here some configuration files. And now we can see the file installed by the cups system, cupsfilters.com. If we were to cat that file, so let's just quickly cat it and see its contents. We will see that this file simply goes LP, PPP dev, and PowerPort PC. So these modules are automatically loaded when the machine reboots or boots up. This is what the, what's important to understand about cold plug devices that have to be configured at boot up time. Most cold plug devices, even if you load the module after the machine is booted up, it won't be able to configure an interface with that device. The device has to be plugged in at boot up time. But it does vary from device to device. Uh, luckily for us, there aren't that many cold plug devices left anymore that we have to worry about. So in this lesson, we've covered more than the basics that you need to know for the 101.1 objective in terms of LPIC. 101. But it's always good to provide you with a conceptual model so that you can further the studies on your own. But once you have a conceptual model, you can think about problems that you come across, think about the issues you're trying to solve, and then using your conceptual model, find additional information, or if you find out your conceptual model is wrong, correct it, and then modify your conceptual model and use it again in future. So what have we covered in this course, in this lesson, that's relevant to these objectives? Well, if we look at the first key knowledge area, enable or disable integrated peripherals. So we've looked at loading and unloading modules. You can also disable or enable peripherals by going to the BIOS or UEFR firmware and enabling or disabling things like the VGA card, network card, etc. We also looked at LSMod for listing modules and Mod Probe for installing modules and configuring modules. We did look a little bit at the dev file system about how device IDs get placed into the dev file system. In future lessons, we'll cover the remaining key knowledge areas, and then we'll have a summary lesson, which will just summarize each key knowledge area succinctly and tie them back to the videos where we cover the details of each particular knowledge area. Thank you. Goodbye.